Hi, and welcome back to Cognitive Science. Uh, we're going to continue now with uh, the lecture on the modularity of mind. So we're going to get some other points about uh, modularity on board here. Um, last time in the first part of the lecture, we talked about the basics of modularity. Um, so there, uh, we discussed this basic concept of a modularity, which is an input-output system for central processes in the way it was traditionally cast. Again, we have this kind of three-level um, picture for mental processes. So there were going to be transducers, which if we think about the input stream are going to be things like eyes, ears, and other sensory organs that are uh, subject to the impingements of the external environment. And they translate uh, those external stimuli into uh, an inf information that uh, the human mind can use, the human brain can use, um, neurochemical signals. Um, and those are then uh, the basis for uh, what ends up being constructed it as our uh, perceptual experience of the world through these kind of modular systems. So the idea again was that these kind of um, transducers send uh, representations of the distal stimuli of light upon the eye, for example, of sound waves hitting the ear. And then um, these low level modules um, take that information. Each one of them doesn't do much work. Um, so you might have a module that detects the edges of surfaces um, from that raw information about light on the eye, another that identifies the shape of objects, and another maybe that identifies um, what the objects actually are. Of course, there are going to be many, many of these simple processes that, um, that achieve different goals related to vision. And the idea is that even though each of these does something very small, together, because they're hierarchically arranged, they can construct something as rich as our perceptual experience of the external world. Um, so even though the information they get is this very limited two-dimensional information, they can end up constructing this vision of a world which is three-dimensional lying out in space around our body. Um, this information then is available to central systems, which we might think of as Kahneman system too. So those are the kind of effortful processing components we think of as ourselves. And of course, we have desires, wishes, and we, active, or we act on those desires and wishes through our actions. And the idea is that there are also gonna be output modules that take those central uh, desires, wishes, beliefs, translate those back into some kind of information that the body then uses, nerve signals that move the body in some way. So we're going to continue talking about these modular subsystems, which again constitute um, the components that give rise to what we can call system one in Kahneman's term. So last time we were talking about these, we identified several different properties of modules. Um, the three most important ones were these ideas of domain specificity, informational encapsulation, and mandatoriness. So domain specificity, again, means that there are specific things, um, specific, specific um, information in the mind that these systems respond to, right? So if we think about something like an edge detecting module that might identify the edges of objects in our environment, then it's gonna be responsive to some uh, proprietary special kind of information about um, the visual domain, right? So it's going to be responding to this kind of simple information about vision itself. Um, and that's all it's going to respond to. It's not going to pay attention to any background information in any way. Informational encapsulation, this other component, is this idea that essentially what's going inside, on inside of these modules is not something that we as uh, thinking individuals can uh, just look at and tell what's happening in there. So if we think about something like the modules that identify um, the words in our native language or the words in the language we understand, right? It takes a long time to recognize from the auditory stream from people speaking where words begin and where words end as we're learning the language. And we don't actually know like how the, the language processing system is um, processing that information about the auditory stream to, to recognize where those word breaks are. Um, we can find out about this information through experimentation, um, but because the kind of way in which these modules do their work is informationally encapsulated, we can't just look into them and see what's going on in there. And similarly, they're not going to be affected by background beliefs, as is shown through something like the mueller liar illusion. You may know the two lines are the same length, but you're still going to see one of them, the one with the uh, inward-facing arrow points, as being longer than the other. 
And then mandatoriness is just this idea that if I am presented with a, a particular stimuli that a particular module responds to, that module will do its work and there's nothing I can do to stop it, right? If that stimuli is there, it's gonna give its output. Again, think of like words in your native language. If you see those, if you see one of those words, you're going to automatically understand its, its semantic significance, the meaning of that word, just because you're presented with um, the, 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 uh, the, the word itself. Okay, so today we're gonna talk a little bit about some of these other features of modules that were identified that seem, it seems like they're not as well supported as we might have thought. So again, some of those we're gonna think about are like, uh, things like uh, neural specificity, ontogenetic uh, development, a kind of standardized development across the, uh, the course of a, of a child's life. And um, we'll talk about uh, some other features of these as well. We're also gonna look at uh, why the mind would have evolved to be a modular system. And so we'll talk a little bit about that too. All right, so um, <clears throat> as I mentioned last time, um, two particular areas of cognition that have been well studied from the modular point of view are vision and language. So it's, it's, it's thought now that these kind of uh, system one processes of vision and language are really realized by these kind of modular subsystems. Um, and let's just see what um, those have. So, I mean, the article discusses this in some detail, right? Um, so it discusses the claim that uh, the perceptual system is modular and also that the language system is modular. And so um, we might ask, first of all, what does it mean to say that a particular system is modular? And I think the point uh, should be pretty clear at this point. What it means is that it is realized by these kind of uh, simple um, subsystems that have that work according to uh, particular defined algorithms that we don't have subject that we don't have access to right um, so uh, what it means is again that, they, that they're going to be these hierarchically arranged um, systems of modules and um, that that we can break down this system into subsystems so we can uh, decompose vision or language into a variety of different subsystems and then um, that these subsystems exhibit the modular characteristics that I've described previously and that Karsten spends a lot of time discussing. So that's what it's gonna mean to say that these things are modular. And so why should we think that vision and language have a modular architecture? Well, this is a question that I want us to debate in some more detail um, uh, on uh, when we meet together for our group discussion. So I want you to think about this for a little bit and um, we'll talk about this some more. Um, and then I think also another kind of question that you might think about is what examples of cognitive process that exhibit, uh, exhibit these properties did you come up with? So this is your homework assignment. So we'll talk a little bit about that um, in more detail later on. So we'll discuss these two components, but of course they're discussed in great detail in the article itself. Okay, so there are various kinds of challenges um, to uh, the claims that are made about uh, the features of modules, um, right? So, so one claim uh, that has been made about uh, language, as we've just been talking about, is that it is a modular system. Um, but if it is a modular system, I mean, for anything that's a modular system, the question, the question naturally arises, okay, what is the domain of stimuli that the modules within the system respond to? And we might think that um, there are certain challenges that arise for domain specificity, uh, for the domain specificity of uh, a language module. That there may not be just one uh, kind of stimuli that turns on a language module. And so what we're gonna think about here is the recognition of uh, phonemes in our language. So the phonemes are essentially the basic um, the basic components of words, like uh, the syllables or the, the sounds that make up words, so the small sounds that make up words. And then our question is, um, or, or, you know, that make them up when they are uh, spoken. And so our question is, well, um, what are the, uh, you, you know, does our language processing system respond only to a particular domain? And so the most obvious domain might be the domain of, um, of sound, of uh, oral stimuli, aural stimuli, right? So stimuli um, to, uh, to uh, hearing. And so um, we might ask, well, does 
is it the case that there is an actual particular domain of sound that um, our modules for recognizing phonemes respond to? And so we're going to look here at a little video, and I'm going to ask you to watch this. I'll start it now, and we'll discuss, I'll discuss it a little bit or tell you a little bit more about it afterwards. So here goes. At any one moment, Just a minute, having a little bit of a technical problem here. So I'm going to try to sort this out real quick. Okay, and so here is the video and I'm going to turn myself off here for just a moment while we watch this. And I'll be back in a second. We are being bombarded. Okay, so let's get back to the PowerPoint now. Okay, so notice uh, a couple of things about this video. So first of all, um, uh, the what is the basic phenomena that's going on here? Well, the basic phenomena is that uh, this visual processing uh, system or, or this um, phoneme processing system, the system that identifies the syllables that have been spoken in the language, um, seems to respond not only to auditory stimuli, not only to auditory information, but also to visual information. So if you hear the same sound, the ba sound, but it's matched to uh, someone who appears to be pre pre uh, pronouncing fa, then the heard syllable, like what you actually hear being said, changes in that case. And now another thing to bear in mind here is that this is like paradigmatically a modular uh, process that's going on. How do we know that? Well, we know that this is modular because it's not subject to background belief. As the experimenter mentions, he's been doing this for years and years and he knows, you know, that this is, that what's being said in these, in these videos is ba. I've seen this a number of times now and I know that as well, but it doesn't matter. The visual brain, as he put it, puts it, responds to those bottom-up stimuli and doesn't care about this background information, okay? So it seems to be informationally encapsulated. No other details are getting in there to affect what's going on, but is there a specific domain that it's answering questions about? Is, it, uh, is there any single domain it's saying something about? Well, that seems to be in doubt um, because, uh, because it's still, because it seems to be um, that it's not simply responding to something from one modality. So does that raise a problem for domain specificity for linguistic modular subsystems? So is our phoneme processor domain specific, in other words, is the question. So I want you to think for a minute, what do you think about this? Is it the case that we can still say that our um, phoneme processor is domain specific, even though it seems to be responding to both visual and auditory stimuli? Okay, so do we have to abandon domain specificity for this module? And if not, how do we avoid abandoning it? So what do we want to say is the specific domain that this particular phoneme processor within our um, audit, within our language processing system is paying attention to? Well, the answer here seems to be um, that we don't have to give up on domain specificity in this case. But what the McGurk effect shows us is that um, the domains that a module responds to may not be entirely obvious to us. It may not be what we would count as like a clear domain of stimuli. Here, your uh, phoneme processor seems to be responding to both auditory and visual stimuli. So we actually learned something interesting about our phoneme processor in this case. If we think about the modular systems uh, underlying our understanding of language, well, then it, it seems that phoneme processing is upstream from both auditory and visual processing units. And that, that those um, processing units, which process sound and, vi and visual stimuli, are feeding into the phoneme processor. And that maybe that is the specific domain that it's responding to, is this kind of auditory visual domain, which is specifically relevant to phoneme processing. So, 
the MacGyver effect ultimately doesn't challenge domain specificity, but it reminds us that domains are, don't have to be defined in any way that we as humans would find natural. They're responding to, um, to uh, specific domains of stimuli that may be cut across different sensory modalities. Now, um, what about informational encapsulation? So remember, information encapsulation tells us, well, you can't know what the kind of processing system within that module is. You don't know how it's doing its work. I mean, you can figure it out through experimentation, but we can't just like into it, look into our, our system one modules and tell how they do their work. Um, and additionally, it says that these kinds of uh, modular systems aren't going to be disturbed by background information. So if we think about the McGurk effect, right? Like knowing that the person is saying ba doesn't change our perception of it as ba in that case, you know, if, um, if, if we have the stimuli in the appropriate way. And uh, similarly, um, uh, we know that, uh, you know, like other, other examples of informational encapsulation are, you know, like the mueller liar illusion. We, we know that these lines are the same length, but they still appear a certain way to us. So one way in which informational encapsulation has been cast as is as um, a module, it responds only to bottom up information, information coming in from below, from modules that lie um, further down in the processing system. And, and there's and, and top down, there's not top down uh, modulation or change for our modular systems, right? Like my beliefs or my feelings or my desires can't change how the module does its work. But the Necker cube may, um, provide a counterexample to this. So what is the Necker cube? Well, you're familiar with this. It's a kind of illustration, uh, a kind of illusion in which we have a two-dimensional object, here a square, um, and it appears three-dimensional. It looks like a cube, right? Um, now, you may be, in examining this object right now, you may be seeing the um, top, uh, the top surface, um, Right. I wish I could underline this in some way, but essentially, um, the uh, you know the kind of um, uh, vertical wall that's facing either the back or the front. You may see that as being the front of the cube, or you may see it as being the back of the cube. Okay. So if you think about the top right corner, um, you may be perceiving that as at the front of the cube from where you are sitting, or you may be perceiving that top right corner is in the back of the cube from where you are sitting. Now, um, that, so think about that, which end of the box is forward to you, is at the front of the cube for you. And now what I want you to try to do is to invert the orientation of the box. So make it so that the other surface is at the front of the cube. I find that it's helpful to do this, to look at um, the small square in the center of the, of the illustration and try to flip how that is oriented. Um, and now you may be able to do this with a little bit of practice. I think you can make it so that you can flip it so that the top, um, the top side is, is at the front or the bottom side is at the front. Um, I've been practicing this for a few years and I can sort of do it willfully now. Um, I can invert the box. Um, so if we were talking in person in class, I would ask you now if this worked. Um, and for me, I think I am able to make this um, flip, and I hope that you're able to, too. And if you were, then it seems that this aspect of your vision system was subject to top-down intrusion, right? So it's not merely that um, the visual perception is responding to bottom-up feedback, and you're seeing the cube in a certain way because of what's coming up from below. Your desire to flip the orientation of the cube, which is um, obviously a system to person level um, mental state, actually can affect the visual perception that you have here. So it seems then that this aspect of your vision system was subject to top-down intrusion, and that suggests that it's not really informationally encapsulated. Um, I think a, an interesting thing for us to discuss when we get together later this week will be like, what's going on here? What, what, what does this mean for modularity? But at least one thing it suggests is that the kind of requirement of informational encapsulation, that, that modules not be responsive to beliefs and desires of the whole system, um, may not be totally set in stone. It may vary from module to module. And I think in general, as the modularity literature has moved forward, 
there's been less of a, a kind of emphasis on these specific properties that modules are supposed to have. And it may be that informational encapsulation is not always present in modules, though it may be in some important examples of modules. Okay, so um, I want to turn now to this question about how the stuff we're discussing now relates back to the evolutionary, uh, the evolution of a human mind, which we've been talking about throughout. And so the basic question is, well, why do modules make good evolutionary sense? And so the article discusses this kind of metaphor of Tempus and Hora, okay? So um, the idea is um, uh, that, um, that uh, Tempus uh, makes, um, that Tempus essentially uh, designs watches. So Tempus and Hora are two watchmakers. Um, Tempus designs watches by um, taking all of the process, taking all the pieces and assembling them at once. Whereas Hora um, designs small components of the watch and then takes those smaller components and puts them all together, right? So Tempest is taking every little part and building a watch out of it. Hora is building small subsystems and putting those small subsystems together. So which of them is going, these is going to be the more impervious to issues, right? If you walk into Tempest's um, workshop and you shout at him, like the whole watch is gonna fall apart. That's gonna destroy the whole system, right? But if you walk into Hora's lab and you disturb him while he's working on a small sub piece, well then just that small sub piece falls apart and the whole system as a whole is not destroyed, right? Um, so what does this suggest? Well, what this suggests is that, um, a system that designed small, fairly self-contained um, uh, mechanical pieces, right? Mechanical in some sense, or, or like uh, we might think organic uh, uh, pieces of, of organisms. Um, a system that designed small pieces would be less impervious to uh, damage. If I destroy one of those small components, then the system as a whole may be able to keep working. And, um, it, and also, uh, right, like, it, like if, if the whole thing is, um, if every piece of the, the system is dependent on every other piece, then if something happens to one system, this whole general cognitive pro, uh, system is just gonna fall apart. So a system that works in piecemeal pieces is going to work better. I think another reason to think the modules make good sense is that if we find it quite natural to think of the human body as consisting of distinct organs with specific purposes, why not the mind, right? So we don't think that, uh, I mean, the story of evolution for physical bodies is a story of small incremental changes um, to organisms over time, like small processes that are developing in the organism, small, um, you know, small uh, changes to the, the um, organic structure, the biological structure of the organism, and those adding up to make um, a greater process over time. But um, it seems weird that when we think of the human mind, that kind of thinking sort of stops in some ways. And we often think of the mind as kind of this general, um, this general uh, purpose uh, thinking machine. But, but actually it makes perfect sense to think that the mind itself consists of distinct organs that do specific things, that have specific purposes, right? Um, that's the story of evolution for bodies, and so presumably it's the story of evolution for minds. And then finally, um, uh, specificity, encapsulation, and mandatoriness make good sense if the goal is to keep an, organ, uh, an organism alive in new environments. Right, um, so domain specificity, uh, informational encapsulation, and mandatoriness, like make good sense if the goal is to keep an organism alive in new environments, right? Um, let's think about encapsulation in particular, um, right? Like I don't want my uh, beliefs about whether or not there is a predator who eats human beings um, present in the specific environment to be dependent upon my background beliefs and desires. I want to see the predator if the predator is there and respond to that and not have this sort of like low level process be subject to what my background beliefs and desires are, right? So the fact that information 
that, that, these, that there would be visual systems that weren't perturbed by background beliefs makes perfect sense. The fact that these would be mandatory makes good sense. And also the fact that they would respond to specific domains makes good sense for keeping organisms alive. Okay, so the modularity picture really fits well with evolution. Um, there's good evidence for it independently, but we might ask if there are um, other, uh, if, if, if again, these modules have to represent or have to exhibit all of the properties that were traditionally attributed to them. So we've already seen some reason for doubting that all modular subsystems are informationally encapsulated. Let's look now at neural specificity and standard ontogenetic development. Right. Again, as I said, early writings viewed modules as innately specified. And if they were innately specified, um, and if they were innately specified, then presumably they would be uh, neurally specified. There'd be a particular part of the brain that developed to realize these modules. And also they would presumably have a kind of standard ontogenetic development, like other um, innately specified traits. Like think about um, you know, it's innate that uh, uh, babies develop teeth. And um, because it's innate, children develop teeth at kind of a standard point in their development, right? Like we could tell, okay, they're going to get these teeth in their first couple of years, these teeth within the, before they're five, and these teeth before they're 12, or something like that, right? And that's true for all humans. They all develop teeth in that way. Um, so that would be standard ontogenetic development. And if modular subsystems were innately specified, when, then we would expect them also to develop in this kind of standard process. But in fact, it seems likely now that we have two kinds of modules, those that are innately specified and those we have acquired from experience. Indeed, it seems likely that, that all of these properties may be represented in some modules, but not others. Um, but um, the basic idea here is that we're going to have, I mean, like, it seems like from the point of view of neural specificity and standard ontogenetic development from the point of view of innateness, it seems like there are going to be some modules that are innate and some that we have acquired from experience. All right, so let's think of some examples of these. Um, so, uh, you know, as, as we've mentioned before, um, it may be that, uh, you know, uh, uh, seeing objects in your environment is an innately specified uh, module. So detecting the edges of objects that surround you in your environment may be an innately specified module. So what does that mean? Well, that means uh, so long as you have the appropriate machinery, so long as you have eyes and uh, you know, your visual, uh, the visual components of your brain are intact, then um, you are going to, um, you know, you're going to uh, see the edges of objects, there's going to be a part of your brain that allows you to see um, the edges of objects, and that's going to be the same across people. So that's going to be neurally specified. There's going to be a standard part that does that. And also, it seems like this is going to develop in a kind of standardized way. So um, if we look over time, um, you know, children uh, develop the capacity to recognize the edges of objects around the same time when they're presented with objects in their environment. That may be actually innate at birth, but there are these other kinds of visual skills that we know are only developed with exposure to objects. Um, so that's going to be something that is, it seems, innately specified. But then there are going to be other kinds of modular or things that look very much like modular systems that um, are acquired from experience. So one example I've talked about is the way in which thinking about skiing or thinking about riding a bike um, in this very effortful, deliberate system two way can actually be subsumed by system one. It can become almost second nature to you. You just like move your muscles in the appropriate way to ski down the hill, right? Um, uh, artists, for example, uh, can develop skills to see objects in certain ways. So it's sometimes said, um, that, uh, you know, in order to be able to draw or, uh, or um, write or, or to draw objects in the appropriate way, you need to see them not as objects, but as a collection of surfaces. So that's not something people innately do, but artists can acquire this kind of ability just to, to do that automatically, right? And it looks like they've created a kind of modular system for performing this. 
obviously like language experts are another kind of example, right? Um, uh, we can learn different languages, learn different grammars and things like that. So, and, and that becomes kind of second nature to us. It happens uh, mandatorily, um, uh, quickly, it responds to a specific domain and so on. So these kinds of traits all look like paradigmatically um, modular systems, but they're not neurally specified. So some people have a part of the brain that allows them to ski down mountains. Some people don't. That's just something that some people have acquired and others haven't, right? Um, so it's, there's not like a, 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 a skiing part of the brain we can point to. That's going to be realized in different people by different parts because it's not innate. And then similarly, it's not as though that develops uh, standardly as uh, an organism grows. It has to be something that we have to work at. So neural specificity and ontogenetic development, standard ontogenetic development, look less promising as real um, concrete features for modules. So if this is right, then features earlier thought to be definitive, module, definitive of module, modules must go uh, by the wayside for many modules as well. Okay, so I want to end with uh, some questions for you to think about. And essentially the thought here is how modular is the mind? So, so far in this and the previous lecture, we've been discussing the idea that system one has a modular architecture. But now I want, I want you to think about, and I want us to discuss when we get together, what about system two or central processing? Um, so why might we think it has a modular structure or why not? So I want you to think about this. I'm actually gonna assign you to think about this in your group work, and then we'll talk about it more when we get together later in the week. Okay, I think that's gonna be it. So I will see you uh, next time. Oh, I may make one slight uh, other presentation that will cover the Galstell article, um, but I'll get that out to you tomorrow if I do, and it won't be more than 10 or 15 minutes, um, and that will be the last component of your work for this week. Okay, I'll see you next time. Have a good day. Bye.